Hey everybody, it's Pastor Chris Mays from New Life Fellowship, and I just want to say welcome to Session 8 of Finding Jesus. We've been taking a look through the Old Testament specifically to see where there are pictures or types or shadows of Jesus concealed in the pages of the Old Testament that we now know living on this side of the cross and having the New Testament uh, that were foreshadows of his coming and what he was going to do, the things that he accomplished. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we've been saying that the entire Bible is the story of Jesus, uh, but the church, the early church, the disciples, they specifically preach Jesus from the pages of the Old Testament. So if they were able to do that, we should be also. Uh, each session, I've started with a New Testament verse uh, showing that the whole Old Testament is about Jesus. It's his story. It's about him. Uh, and since we've been specifically talking about the ministry of Moses and the Old Covenant and the things concealed there, uh, I wanted to read a verse where Paul was writing to the church in Colossae, and he was telling them not to let anyone judge them about keeping the Sabbath or observing festivals or looking at the calendar and, and keeping track of the moon uh, festivals and the things that they had to do under the old covenant and this is what he says in Colossians 2 17 it says for these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come and Christ himself is that reality the things that the people were doing to keep the law weren't meant to just be another box to check to make God happy but they were pictures that would help them recognize when Jesus Christ himself came onto the scene uh, when Jesus came the religious leaders had been putting more weight on the temple and the the actual things in the temple and the observances of the law uh, than the one who created them so they missed Jesus's coming but Paul reminds us that everything that was written in all of those observances of the law were fulfilled in Christ they were just pictures of him and his work uh, so last session we left off with God telling Moses what signs he should perform when he went to Pharaoh we're in the middle of the book of Exodus chapter 4 and Moses had this staff in his hand, and God was telling him, here's what you're going to do when you go see Pharaoh. Uh, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, God says, Then you will tell him, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. So if Egypt is a picture of sin in the world, this is declaring that one day there will be a son who sets the world free, that sin will have no hold on him. This picture is a great example of reading the Bible as one continuous story and looking for Jesus in the middle of it. There really is a singular narrative woven throughout the scripture. Uh, you wouldn't know that this is a picture of Jesus without reading the rest of the book. When God tells Moses, hey, go tell Pharaoh, Israel's my firstborn son, how is that a picture of Jesus? We might miss it if we didn't have the rest of scripture. Uh, fast forward about 600 years and the prophet Hosea was talking about how Israel was loved by God but they kept wandering off from him they kept rejecting him and in Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 it says when Israel was a child I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son he portrays the nation of Israel as a son who doesn't obey but one day it says later in the, that chapter 11 of Hosea that one day they will obey when God roars like a lion so there's pictures that he's starting to shape, even from God telling Moses, go tell Pharaoh, Israel's my firstborn son. Uh, Hosea picks up on that and ties it into the coming of Jesus later, where he says, Israel is my son, but he keeps wandering away, but one day he will be completely free. We realize that Israel being the firstborn son was a picture of Christ when Matthew tells us that Hosea was prophesying about Jesus. Uh, if you remember, Herod wanted to kill uh, Jesus. He, he ordered the death of all the male children under two years old in the region because he was trying to kill Jesus. And Joseph was warned in a dream. He took Mary and Jesus and he went to Egypt to stay there until Herod died, until the threat had passed. And in Matthew 2.15, it says, And they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Man, Matthew really is one of the ones. He's viewing the Old Testament scriptures uh, and the writings contained there through a Christocentric lens. He's looking for Jesus in all the pages of the story, and he even picks up on God telling Moses, Israel's my firstborn son, it being echoed by Hosea, out of Egypt I've called my son. And Matthew says, this, this day, 
when Jesus is here and he, he was rescued uh, from Herod's hand by going to Egypt and then coming back to Israel, he says, that was a picture of Christ because out of Egypt I have called my son. Uh, so back to Moses in our story. Moses goes to see Pharaoh. He asks for a three-day journey so that the people can go sacrifice. Man, little did we know there would be a perfect sacrifice that took three days later in our story. But he asked Pharaoh for that. And throughout chapter 5 of Exodus, every time that they ask for the people to be let go, uh, Pharaoh makes the people's burden heavier. He takes the straw away from them making bricks. He t increases their workload. There was something every time that God said, hey, set my people free. He sent Moses to deliver that message. Pharaoh, representing sin in the world and the devil, made things harder. Uh, the law had been given to the Israelites. It was meant to connect them to God. But over the course of the centuries, the religious leaders, just like Pharaoh did, the people were supposed to be free to connect to God. The religious leaders made the burden heavier and heavier uh, to the point uh, they took 619 rules and added rules on top of those to help them keep the rules to the point where it was such a burden no one could do it. And Jesus even rebuked them. In Luke 11:46. It says, yes, said Jesus, what sorrow awaits you experts in religious law? For you crush people with impossible religious demands and you never lift a finger to ease the burden. Man, John even records Jesus calling the religious leaders sons of the devil. Man, just like Pharaoh made the burden harder every time the people were supposed to go free, over the course of centuries, the religious leaders with evil in their hearts made the burden heavier and heavier until no one could be free at all. They couldn't even enter themselves. Uh, that was the same picture of what had been done in Egypt. And the people needed a deliverer. They needed someone to come and to set them free. So in Exodus 7, Moses goes to see Pharaoh. Uh, he starts to use the staff that was in his hand. If you remember last week, we talked about it being the staff of the chief shepherd. That's where the real power is. And in Exodus 7, Moses starts to use that staff. In, uh, in verse 10 of Exodus 7, uh, Moses has Aaron take the staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it becomes a serpent. And uh, Come on, anytime snakes show up, a lot of Christians get really nervous. They get upset about it, uh, from the serpent in the garden in the book of Genesis, all the way to Revelation calling the devil the great and ancient serpent. Uh, we get a little upset anytime we see stories about serpents or snakes coming in it. In fact, I have a hard time thinking of snakes being anything good, but even in this story of Moses' staff turning into a serpent, there's a picture of Jesus. Uh, in Matthew 10, 16, Jesus actually told his disciples to be like snakes. Uh, in Matthew 10, 16, he says, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Come on. Here in this verse, according to Jesus, we have a serpent representing wisdom. Although it's wisdom, come on, wisdom was a personification of Jesus in Scripture. Uh, anytime you see wisdom and they say, seek this out more than treasure, desire it more than gold and riches, it's a personification of Jesus. And so he says, be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. There's an aspect here of being shrewd or cunning, but harmless to the people around you. Uh, Pharaoh's magicians, they also made their staffs turn into snakes, but they were just poor imitations of the true power and the wisdom of God. Uh, as they were wiggling on the ground, Moses' rod that had also turned into a serpent ate or consumed the other staffs, the other serpents. Uh, God was showing that the power and authority of the one true God was more powerful than any counterfeit that the devil or the world could produce. Reminds me of a resurrection promise. Even, even when those snakes were swallowed up by Moses' staff, uh, it reminds me of a resurrection promise in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, where it says, death will be swallowed up in victory. Uh, but that's not the only good snake from Moses' story. Uh, his staff that actually was more powerful than the other ones. If you fast forward to their journey in the desert, there was a time when, the, uh, in Numbers 21, when the Israelites were complaining and grumbling against Moses. And it says, venomous snakes 
actually began to come into the camp and bite the people, and many of them even died. It was very painful. It was a judgment coming upon them for complaining and grumbling. And in Numbers 21, verse 8, the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Man, the remedy to their condition, all these snakes coming in judgment and tormenting them, the remedy to their condition was an act of faith. Just look. If all you have to do is turn your eyes towards the snake on the pole and you will be healed. You, the snakes will go away. The effects of their bites won't harm you anymore. Come on again. The good snake had more power than the evil ones in this story. And believe it or not, that snake on the pole that Moses made is actually an explicit picture of Jesus. It was confirmed by no less than Jesus himself. Uh, he came one time at night to have a conversation with Nicodemus. And this is what he says in John 3, 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Come on, those verses are right before John 3.16, which is arguably the most famous verse in the whole Bible. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. So right before that, he's telling Nicodemus, hey, what's about to happen is just like when Moses lifted that snake on the pole. That's what's going to happen to me as I'm crucified. And just like all they had to do to get relief from the snake bite was to look to choose to believe, to say, I'm going to take it as an act of faith. It doesn't make any sense in the natural, but I'm just going to lift my eyes up and look at that snake on the pole. And they were healed from their disease. Just like that, we receive by faith. It might not make any sense, but we simply believe that what Jesus did on the cross takes away all of our sin, releases us from the power of death, puts us in right standing with God. It's a simple act of faith. To get deliverance from sin and death, we just have to believe. So there is a picture of a snake in the Old Testament that still points us to Jesus. Next time you have a vision of a snake, uh, don't immediately assume it could be bad. Maybe it's something about God releasing wisdom or healing or power into your life. I don't know what it is, but if you get the sense and, and lack peace about it and you say, oh, I saw a snake and it was bad, pray about it and ask God uh, to manifest that deliverance that he's given us uh, from the devil and the powers that he afflicts us with. So we're going to continue on through Moses' confrontations with Pharaoh. Uh, he goes as he's talking to him. Pharaoh's heart is hard. He's stubborn. And God begins to release ten plagues upon Egypt. Uh, and as they're suffering those ten plagues, I'll give you the payoff up front of how I think that them suffering these ten plagues was a picture of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it's talking about Jesus, and Paul writes this, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Come on, there are all kinds of powers that try to exercise authority in this world, natural authority and in the spiritual realm. Uh, Jesus rules over all of these things. Every other God you could think of, every other power, every other authority, any name that you could ever name, Jesus is above them all. In fact, Colossians 2.15, that says Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities by his victory on the cross. He took away the power from every other God that could have been contending to have power. What does this have to do with the plagues? Every plague that was released upon Egypt represented a God that the Egyptians worshipped and trusted in. The, the great I am, if you will, was demonstrating that he was the one true God, that his power was greater than any other God that the Egyptians could name or try to rely on or worship. The plagues and the stopping of the plagues was a manifestation of spiritual power. It was a picture of the ultimate victory that Jesus would one day uh, gain through his death and resurrection, that every name would have to bow. So the gods that the Egyptians worshipped, uh, they were viewed as protectors and sustainers of life. Uh, I want to give you a quick list of what plagues uh, defeated which gods or what, what the Egyptians would have thought when they saw those plagues coming. You can study this list in more detail for yourself. It's kind of a neat list to get into. Uh, I'm just going to hit it quickly because I want to keep our focus on looking for pictures of Jesus and proving that this was a picture of his ultimate victory that gave him the name above every other name. 
Uh, the first thing that happened when Moses uh, was talking to Pharaoh, the plague that was released was the Nile River turned to blood. Uh, the Nile was literally the lifeblood of the nation. It helped them grow crops and sustain themselves in the middle of a desert. And they believed that the god Hopi controlled the river. Not happy, but Hopi. Uh, and their god was unable to stop everything in the river from dying. When that plague was released, it was revealed that Hopi really had no power when it came up to uh, standing against Jehovah, the great I Am. Uh, even the river had to be subjected, and everything in the river died what was a source of life became a source of death to them uh, that was the first plague the second one was a plague of frogs that was released uh, the egyptians worshipped a fertility goddess called heket and believe it or not heket's symbol the statue of heket has the head of a frog and as Moses was coming against them, all these frogs came into the land. What they believed would have been a sign of fertility actually was a sign of discomfort. And the frogs ended up dying and created a stench that was repulsive to the Egyptians. So Heket was defeated uh, when the plague of frogs came. Uh, then the third thing that happened, there was a plague of either lice or gnats or mosquitoes. Depending on what translation you have of the Bible, uh, what word they choose to render there. there. There are some debates over what these things were, uh, but uh, what type of insect it was wasn't as important as where it came from. Uh, it says that they, they came when Moses' staff hit the ground or the dust of the region. Uh, the, the Egyptians worshipped a god called Geb who was the god of the earth or the ground. The ground, the very dust of the earth itself, that they relied on this god Geb to make a, a place of fertility and where crops could grow and produce comfort for them and be a source of life. The very ground itself turned into a source of pain and discomfort. Uh, whether it was lice or mosquitoes or gnats, they all sound bad to me. I don't want to be around any of them. Uh, but in this plague, God defeated the god Geb that the Egyptians worshipped. This was actually the first plague that the Egyptian magicians couldn't reproduce. They didn't have the power to even make a counterfeit out of this one. The next thing that came after that uh, is commonly called the plague of flies. And interestingly, God commanded Moses before this plague was released to go see Pharaoh very early in the morning, before just as the sun was rising or before the sun had come up. And probably what was happening is Pharaoh was actually on his way to the river, maybe to go worship the goddess Kepri who was the god of the morning or the renewal of the day. And uh, is interesting because Kepri was represented by a statue that had the head of a beetle, uh, a dung beetle to be more precise, because uh, they, they looked at dung on the ground and saw these uh, beetles emerge from it, not knowing how nature works or the eggs had been laid there. Uh, they just looked at it and said, oh, life has come out of death. It's a symbol of renewal. Uh, so this goddess had the head of a beetle uh, interestingly, the, the text here, the, there is no Hebrew word for flies in there. That's not specifically in the text. Uh, it only uses the word for swarms. So it could have been a swarm of flies. It could have been a swarm of beetles that invaded the land and began to bite people. Uh, I don't know which one it was for sure. If it was flies, uh, this is God showing that the morning and the, that was supposed to bring renewal into them instead brought death because that's what attracts flies. And we also know that the devil is called Beelzebub, or the Lord of the Flies, and Jesus defeated him too. Uh, but this was a plague that came on their land that defeated the god Ket Kepri, and this was the first plague that didn't affect the Israelites. The place where they lived was set apart. The insects, whatever swarm it was, didn't come into their land, and it was a sign to everyone that we are God's chosen people. His hand of protection is upon us. Uh, the next thing that happened after the, the plague of flies or beetles, whichever it was, uh, was a plague on the livestock. All kinds of Egyptian animals got sick and died, but not one Hebrew animal died. Not one Hebrew animal got sick. It was verified by uh, Pharaoh and his rulers. Uh, the Egyptians worshipped a goddess called Hathor, who was the 
depicted as wearing the headpiece of a cow. It had the horns of a cow on top of it and the disc of the sun. And she was considered to protect motherhood and nourishment. So where we would get milk from cows, uh, where, where it would produce life that would sustain, that was what she ruled over. Uh, there were other deities, including a, a guy called Aphis, uh, who was literally depicted as a bull. Uh, there were other gods that looked like cows that the, the uh, Egyptians worshipped. You can see it throughout their art and even in some of their, their hieroglyphs and things that were on the pyramids and the tombs that they found. Uh, in fact, bull worship was so common that it actually got Israel in trouble. After they left Egypt, if you remember, while Moses was taken too long on the mountain, they made a golden calf. Aaron says, we just, we just threw stuff in the fire, and this is what popped out, this golden calf. Uh, so there was a lot of worship of, of cows happening in Egypt at the time. And when this plague came and attacked their livestock, uh, it was a direct assault showing that God is more powerful than Hathor or Anus or any of the other gods that were depicted as cattle. Uh, the next one that came was a plague of boils or sores. Uh, there was a goddess that they worshipped called Sekhmet, and she was considered to be an agent of Ra's vengeance. Uh, it says plagues and disease did her bidding. They were her messengers. Uh, but she also was called on to cure diseases. So, so she, she sent diseases on the enemies of Egypt, uh, but they would call on her to actually cure diseases when they broke out among the people. And uh, it says her breath was like the hot winds of the desert. And I think it's very interesting that uh, God told Moses, go take ashes out of the brick kiln, what had been uh, reduced by fire to ashes. And that's what he threw up into the air. And it says, as that dust spread throughout the land, it caused an outbreak of boils and sores on every Egyptian that it touched. Uh, so God defeated another Egyptian God uh, when the boils and sores broke out. And then Moses was also able to stop them. Uh, God has more power than any of the, the gods of Egypt. The next plague that happened was the plague of hail. Uh, there were a couple gods that this, this came directly into conflict with. Shu was an Egyptian god of peace, wind, and the air. And there was also a god they worshipped called Nut. Nut was a goddess of the sky. That was her dominion. And when the hail broke out, it says the hail and lightning accompanying it uh, was so severe that nothing like that in Egypt had ever happened since that time. Uh, everything in the field was destroyed, even the trees. I think it's interesting, everything that wasn't under a covering suffered. Man, thank you, Jesus, that you are our covering, that you are God that watches over us, that we are not destroyed uh, by anything that comes against us. This was the first plague that Pharaoh acknowledged he had done something wrong, that he sinned about not letting God's people go. But even after this, he still changed his mind and kept them in Egypt. Uh, if you read through that plague, Moses said that stopping this plague, the hailstorm that came, uh, Moses said, when this hailstorm stops, you will know that the earth belongs to the Lord. Again, God is demonstrating his power and victory and authority over everything uh, that the Egyptians thought were controlled by a bunch of gods or lesser deities. Uh, the next thing that happened was a plague of locust. Uh, Set was the god of violence, chaos, and the desert. And there was a wind that came and blew the locust into the land. Uh, there was also a goddess called Serapia who protected the crops and specifically kept pests from devouring them. Uh, so the wind blew the locust in, they devoured everything that was left after the hailstorm. Any fruit that was still on a tree, anything that was still growing on a vine, the locust completely consumed it. Uh, this plague and the hail were recorded as saying nothing like this had ever happened in history. God brought things upon them that were unmatched in recorded history at that time. The next thing that happened was a plague of darkness. Uh, Moses actually told Pharaoh that the darkness would be so thick you could feel it. Have you ever been in a darkness like that where it was uncomfortable almost? It just felt tangible even the darkness that was there. That's where a lot of us were living before Jesus. 
Uh, there was a god in Egypt. One of the highest Egyptian deities was called Ra, the sun god. There were several other lesser sun gods. There were several moon gods that they worshipped. Uh, but this was a direct assault against Ra. He ruled over all parts of the created world and uh, had influence there. He was the highest one. Even the other gods, uh, when you see some of the headpieces, whether it was a cow or a frog or a beetle or, or different animals, uh, a lot of them also had a, a disc in the middle of it that represented the sun because Ra was over them. So there was darkness for three days, uh, but it says in scripture that there was light as usual in the land where Israel lived. I don't know how God worked that out, but darkness came upon the Egyptians and over in Goshen, it was light as usual. And uh, in the middle of this darkness, Pharaoh told Moses that he would never see him again. And he says, if you see my face again, you will surely die. And Moses said, you're right, you're not gonna see me again. And he left. And uh, that set the stage for the last plague that came upon the people. It was the death of the firstborn. Up until this point, uh, the plagues had affected their comfort, their food sources, their livelihood, but now it touched their very future as a people, the next generation that would reproduce. Uh, this was an attack on the Egyptian belief that Pharaoh himself was a god. Uh, at this time, his word was like the morning sun. Everything that he said was treated as, as God saying it, and Pharaoh couldn't even protect uh, his own household, his own firstborn. This was the worst plague of all that took the life of the firstborn. Uh, it's, just, it's almost like sowing and reaping. Just as the Egyptians had tried to kill all the male Israelite children uh, when they knew there was a deliverer going to be born or that they were too numerous, uh, they tried to put to death all of the Hebrew sons. Uh, they were now losing their firstborn in this plague. And uh, to show you all those plagues that I said uh, they were attacking an Egyptian god or showing that, that God himself was the one true God and more powerful than all the Egyptian deities, uh, God said this about what the plagues were going to do. In Exodus 12, 12, he says, I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. So the one true God is saying, hey, all these things that you're seeing, they, they might be uh, different plagues in shape and nature, but what I'm doing is I'm executing judgment upon the gods that Egypt has been worshiping. And during that last plague, the death of the firstborn, God instituted a new observance that would protect the Israelites and be one of the greatest pictures of Jesus ever given, the Passover. Uh, we talked a little bit about this before. Each household was commanded to take a spotless lamb into their home. They were to take care of the lamb and watch it for five days to make sure it had no defects. And then they were supposed to kill it at the end of the, that time of watching it. Uh, in Exodus 12, 7, it says they are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. Come on, even in this act of smearing the blood on the doorpost, it's the shape of a cross. Uh, we are also reminded in putting the blood on the door that Jesus himself is the door. He's the good shepherd that protects the entrance to the sheep pen. Uh, this blood, when the, when the destroying angel came through the region, through the land to kill the firstborn, when he saw the blood on the door, it represented there's already been a death here. And he would pass over the house and not affect them. And uh, we mentioned it before, how is this a picture of Jesus? How they should have seen it in everything they did. They should have recognized Jesus. But even John the Baptist, he explicitly says this uh, when Jesus is coming to be baptized in John 1, 29. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist was himself declaring that Jesus was the fulfillment of the very picture, the meal that they had done for centuries. All of those lambs that had been slaughtered over the centuries, Jesus was here as the fulfillment of it. He was here not just to cover sin, but to take it away. His death would pay the price for anything that death would have a hold on us about. Uh, the shepherds at Jesus' birth most likely were the ones that were tending the fields where the sacrificial lambs were raised uh, to be used in Passover. Uh, Jesus was publicly observed. He came to Jerusalem for a week beforehand for people to watch him and examine him to make sure he was a spotless lamb. And his blood was applied to our lives to set us free from the power of sin and death. After the plagues, 
the people left Egypt following Moses as their deliverer. Uh, this is the last thought I want to share for this session, uh, just about Moses himself being a picture of a deliverer or a picture of Jesus. Uh, Moses was the mediator of the old covenant, just as Jesus brought the new covenant into effect. Uh, Moses was born to become Israel's deliverer, and Jesus was born to be our Savior. Uh, at one point, towards the end of his leadership, Moses was speaking to the people in Deuteronomy 18.15. It says, Moses continued, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. A prophet like me? What does that mean? Uh, Moses had a face-to-face -face relationship with God and spoke to the people on God's behalf. Jesus was God himself. Talking about having a face-to-face -face relationship, Jesus was God himself, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and he came to proclaim his word over us. Uh, after Jesus raised a young boy from the dead, Luke 7, 16 says, They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has emerged among us, they said. God has come to help his people. They were put in mind of Moses' words, saying, Hey, eventually a prophet like me will appear among you and bring salvation for you. Uh, in Jesus fed the multitude in John 6, 14. After that was done, it says, When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we had been expecting. So again, that picture that Moses gave, just like me, there's going to be somebody that God's going to raise up to deliver you. Uh, after telling people that he would give them a river of living water flowing from inside of them. In John 7 40 it says when the crowds heard him say this some of them declared surely this man is the prophet we've been expecting. So Moses himself his life his ministry the way he delivered the people the way he saw God face to face and spoke for him he declared to the people there's going to be one coming after me I'm just a picture I'm a type in a shadow we said last week Moses wasn't perfect but Jesus came on the scene and it reminded people oh what Moses said all those years ago what was concealed in the Old Testament is now being revealed surely this man is the prophet that was promised to be sent to us. So I'm going to stop there for this session. Uh, we already touched on the bronze snake from the wilderness journey when the people came out of Egypt. And uh, before they got to the promised land, their 40-year camping expedition in the wilderness. Uh, we talked about the bronze serpent being a picture of Jesus. Uh, but next week, uh, we're going to do a third part on Moses' life. We'll look at some of the other things. We'll look at the crossing over the Red Sea, what that represented. Uh, we're going to look at the pillars of fire and cloud that led them through the wilderness. We're going to look at the manna the rock that followed them through the desert, uh, some of these pictures from their wilderness journey. And then after that, uh, we're still going to hit some other elements of the tabernacle and the observances of the law. I think there's more to say on that, more pictures of Jesus to encourage ourselves with. Uh, so in the meantime, let me just pray for us. Father God, thank you for your word that speaks to us and reveals Jesus. Thank you for the victory that was so complete that you executed on the cross. Hmm. Thank you that just as the plagues uh, defeated and showed that you were more powerful than all those gods that, that vied for authority in the world, uh, the victory of Jesus was so complete that no weapon formed against us can prosper, that, that no enemy could have a hold in our lives. We thank you for that love that you had for us, that you sent Jesus. And I ask that you would continue to encourage us by uh, reminding us that it's a story about Jesus that is a, a story that we're included in as well. And we thank you and we honor you now. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me. Uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. And I'll see you next time.